Right, I spent all last week talking about the Interceptor and the Continental GT, but let's not forget they also have a pretty little sister, the Classic 500. This is a video that actually I've been intending to make for quite some time. In fact, I expected to have made it sometime last year. I've had dozens of comments over the last year saying how rubbish the chains are on the Classic 500, with people claiming that they have all the structural integrity of warm toffee, with some people claiming they'd had to replace the chain at a thousand miles or roundabout there. So I expected to have made a chain adjustment video not long after I got the bike, but that didn't happen. The manual says that chain slack should be between between 25 and 30 millimeters. At the first service, it was more or less in the middle of that range at about 26, 27 millimeters. I continue to check it regularly and at 1500 miles, it was just on the 30 millimeter mark. And then a few miles down the road, finally, chain slack exceeded the 30 millimeter limit so I could go ahead and do the video. Now, for a first time adjustment, that's not bad. Chains do usually wear excessively when they're new and do require the first adjustment in the first two to 3,000 miles. So I would say this is just about on par with any other bike I've got. Perhaps not the best chain in the world, but certainly not the rubbish I was led to believe it would be. And certainly one thing that I do like about this standard chain is that the side plates have been blued or powder coated. So, so far, they're also pretty corrosion resistant. I am a firm believer that excessive tyre wear and excessive chain wear is often the result of certain people's riding habits. As a rule of thumb, my philosophy is that a pillion or passenger should not be able to feel gear changes. You know, we've all been on the back of the bike with someone or we've been in a car with someone where every gear change has you lurching backwards and forwards in your seat. That to me is bad riding practice and that's what causes excessive drivetrain wear and tyre wear. Now that doesn't mean you have to ride like an old lady, there's a big difference between riding fast and riding fast and trashing your drive chain at the same time. A bit of practice with smooth and precise gear changes will save you money and save you time in the long run. As you've just seen, the chain slack was running at about 34 millimeters. Take any pictures that you see on this video of actual measurements with a pinch of salt. It's not always possible to get the right angle with a camera. The parallax effect can sort of skew the readings in the camera's view so incidents of me taking measurements on this video are just for demonstration purposes. Now what I decided to do with this video was do a complete chain maintenance, chain care video including cleaning and re-lubing as well as chain adjustment. It took me almost an entire day day to film this which I found embarrassing. Royal Enfield like to do things a little bit differently to everyone else. I mean I must have adjusted a hundred chains Oh, sorry I'll rephrase that I must have adjusted chains a hundred times in my lifetime but for about two hours this one had me stumped and I have to say the mechanism that Royal Enfield are using here it defies the laws of physics. I still can't get my head around quite how it works. Also, the instructions in the owner's manual are incomplete, just at the part that I needed to know, so, you know, it was a nightmare for a while. But I got there in the end, and hopefully this video will answer questions for other people that have come across the same issue. I never adjust a dirty chain, or very rarely adjust a dirty chain. So generally speaking, whenever a chain needs adjusting, I go through a complete cleaning procedure, not just of the chain, but of the swing arm, the chain guard, and anywhere else that chain lube fling collects. Generally speaking, this stuff does absolutely no harm. In fact, in some respects, especially where chrome rims are concerned, it does protect from rust, but it gets to a point where you have such a high build-up that it starts sort of dropping off on your garage floor. 
then you stand in it and then you trips it through the house and then it causes an argument and you have to buy her indoors a new pair of shoes or a handbag to say sorry so it's best just not to get into that and I generally clean it off at least once a year depending on the mileage I've done now irrespective of what chain lube you're using on your actual chain Generally speaking, as a rule of thumb, I will lube three times between cleans. It doesn't matter what you're using, all chain lube is sticky and it attracts grit. So if you just keep lubing it and you never clean it, eventually what you have is essentially a grinding paste, which will long term actually cause premature wear. There are various chain cleaning products on the market for the last couple of years, I've been using a water-based product from Built Hamber, which is one of the better ones that I've come across. It seems to me to go a lot further than most of the solvent-based ones that you get in a can. Just liberally coat your chain with this stuff working on the inside on the bottom run. Leave it for a few minutes to soak in, then give it a good scrub in all directions with a chain brush. And this is your first rough clean. After that, clean your brush up again with the degreaser and then give the chain another coat of degreaser. There's no need to leave it to soak in after this because the previous coat that you put on will have soaked well in by now. Then take a couple of squares of workshop wipes. Now, people are always asking me about these products that I use, so I will leave a list of links in the video description down below. And with that workshop wipe, give the whole chain a really good firm clean. And this should get off most of the remaining chain lube that was missed by that first scrub. Then one final coat of degreaser, leave it for a few minutes and rinse off thoroughly with a hose pipe. Then take another workshop wipe and dry it off by hand. Now this won't get rid of all the water and I'm not going to be re-lubing the chain until I've made the chain adjustment. So I use a water dispersant, otherwise these chains can literally start rusting within a few minutes. Muckoff's MO94 is designed for this task and it is o-ring safe. Just a light coat on the inside run of your chain will be enough to displace any remaining water that you've not reached with your cloth or workshop wipe. Once you've put it on, just give it a wipe off with another workshop wipe and you've got a nice clean chain that's prepped for lubing but more importantly in this case is relatively clean so you're not going to get too messed up while you're adjusting your chain. Right, chain adjustment on the Royal Enfield Classic 500. This is where we drift off into the twilight zone so pay attention. Now if you've used a water soluble degreaser like me you're going to have a wet patch on your dry floor now so move your bike forward to a dry patch because there's going to be some kneeling maybe even sitting down on the floor while you do this. And then it's time to wander down this Royal Enfield rabbit hole. The axle is secured with two nuts. A large nut that Royal Enfield describes as being the sprocket nut and then a smaller lock nut which Royal Enfield describes as the axle nut. They are both threaded onto the same thread on the axle. So the presumption I made here is that they are both axle nuts but the locking nut is just designed to ensure that the main axle nut doesn't come loose while you're riding. To stop the axle from spinning while you're doing this, you'll need to insert something like a screwdriver into the hole on the left-hand end of the axle to hold it in place. So, the owner's handbook tells you to remove the axle nut, which is the smaller lock nut of the two nuts, and then remove the larger nut, which, as I've said, they describe as being the sprocket nut. The owner's book makes no reference to removing the exhaust system to facilitate this. I've got the Hitchcock's pipe on and it soon became apparent that I wasn't going to be able to do this. I don't have any large ring spanners. So after I'd removed the locking nut I decided to remove the silencer as well. A to make it easier for me and B to give a better view for the camera. So once you've removed that locking nut just loosen off the larger nut, the sprocket nut by two or three turns. You don't want to be loosening the axle up 
too much because then it all starts to sort of flop about and it makes adjustment of your chain difficult because everything's just too loose. It needs to be loose enough that your adjusters can work without putting undue pressure on them, but not too loose that the whole thing just slides back in the uh, swing arm. Because if that happens, you'll be wrestling with the back wheel and your actual adjusters won't function correctly. So, so far so good. A slightly unusual setup with the locking nut, but I could see the point of having a locking nut there as a belt and braces job. And I saw it as a sort of throwback from the old days of castellated axle nuts with a split pin to secure it. At the end of your swing arm on both sides there is a threaded adjuster with two 12mm nuts attached. The first nut is just a locking nut that's designed to stop the actual adjuster nut from moving by itself. So these need to be slackened off slightly on both sides. The actual adjuster nut itself is what actually adjusts the tension on the chain. Turning it clockwise will increase tension on the chain. Turning it anti-clockwise will decrease tension on the chain. Now, as this chain was very slightly loose, we wanted to increase tension. So it's a matter of slowly and incrementally increasing the tension by turning both of these adjusters equally on both sides. Now, you don't have to turn these nuts very far to make quite a huge adjustment in the chain. I think I worked out about a quarter of a turn of this nut was equal to about 5 millimeters of chain adjustment. So if you adjust it too far and it's too tight, you may have to turn it back the other way to release the tension a little bit. But the most important thing to remember here is to ensure that both sides are adjusted equally. Otherwise, you're going to knock the rear wheel out of alignment. Free play should be measured on the bottom run approximately halfway or midway along the chain. This was made easy for me because at the factory they had clearly marked it and the mark was still present on the bike. And I adjusted the tension to about 27 millimeters, about midway along the specifications recommended by Royal Enfield. Now, I don't trust the index markings for wheel alignment on any bike, it's not just Royal Enfield. So I used a steel rule to measure from the center of the axle to the end of the adjustment aperture. To ensure that the distance was exactly the same on both sides now when you do this make sure that the rear wheel is butted up hard against the adjusters because on the left hand side the wheel does have a little bit of a habit of drifting back out of place so push the rear of the rear tire firmly towards the front of the bike while you take this measurement and once you've done this using two 12 millimeter open-ended spanners tighten the lock nut up on the adjuster without actually affecting the adjuster. Do that on both sides to make sure that those values do not move out of adjustment and it's time to fasten the axle back up and this is where I run into a problem. And this just goes to show that it doesn't matter how experienced with bikes you are, there's always something that you haven't come across before. Now the manual says to make sure that the wheel is in alignment and then fasten up the sprocket nut to 70 newton meters, which is what I did. But there was still free play on the left hand side of the axle, it wasn't fastened in place. The sprocket side was secured, but the opposite side, the left hand side of the axle, was loose. So I unfastened it, made sure everything was in place properly and again tightened it up to 70 newton meters with the same result. I then did it a third time with the same result. I've never come across this before. I came to the conclusion that either I'd broken something or something had come adrift inside the swing arm so that the axle wasn't engaging properly. I again checked the manual for clues, but this is when another problem came in, because the guy that had written the manual, he'd got to this bit, then it was his tea break, and then when he came back from his tea break, 
he'd completely forgotten about this and he'd moved on to the next section of the manual because there was no mention of what to do next, bearing in mind that according to the manual you still hadn't put the axle nut back on the locking nut. When it comes to reassembly the manual doesn't mention it at all. Now I didn't have access to my Haynes manual because I'd lent it to somebody and not got it back. I spent two and a half hours surfing the net on various forums trying to get a clue as to what might be causing this problem but couldn't find any information whatsoever. Now, it had crossed my mind once or twice that putting the lock nut on might solve this problem, but I'd come to the conclusion that that wouldn't make any difference because the lock nut fastens onto the same thread on the axle as the big nut, the sprocket nut, so all it would do is put pressure on the sprocket nut, there's no way it would take up the slack in the axle. It's simple physics, there's no way it can tighten the axle up. Until, eventually, out of pure desperation, I gave it a try, and guess what? With very little force required, the locking nut secured the left-hand side of the axle. And I've got absolutely no idea how or why it does that. It defies the laws of physics. There's obviously some voodoo going on inside the swing arm that I'm just not aware of. Now, as the manual never mentions even putting this nut back on again, I tightened it up to about 40 newton meters initially because I didn't want to cause any damage. Late last night, I managed to get my Haynes manual back, which shed a little bit of light onto this issue. Because the Haynes manual tells you to tighten up the sprocket nut, although it doesn't give any values as to how far it should be tightened up, and then thread on the locking nut or axle nut and tighten that up to 70 newton meters. In the greater scheme of things, 70 newton meters for axle fasteners is not a lot. In fact, it's the lowest I've ever come across. And this axle assembly, the size of the nuts and the threads will take it. So this morning I went back, took the whole thing apart again and tightened the axle nut up to 70 newton meters as well. Whether that's correct or not, who knows, because both Royal Enfield and Haynes are giving, you know, conflicting information on how this should be done. And if you follow the Royal Enfield manual, you don't get the job finished, it's as simple as that. I took the bike for a good 40 mile test ride, I checked everything out after the ride, everything was fine, so I'm going to leave it at that. Now, if anyone else has further information that they would like to share that is reliable on this issue and they're able to do it politely, please feel free to do so. So, once you've got everything put back together, just check your chain slack once again because, you know, in the past I have known things to change slightly while you're fastening everything up. And providing everything is okay, it's time to get on with lubing your chain. My chain lube of choice is Silkaline Titanium Chain Lube. When it dries, it dries to a sort of waxy consistency. Now, using a piece of cardboard, lube the bottom run on the inside of the chain using a piece of cardboard to protect bits that you don't want lubricating until you've put a medium coat on the entire length of the chain. Now, most videos and books will tell you to lube the chain on the outside around the rear sprocket, but I've got an issue with this. If you lube the outside of the chain, centrifugal force will throw 80% of that lube off once you start riding the bike. If you lube it on the inside, you're lubricating the rollers that are coming in contact with the sprockets, and the centrifugal force will throw the remainder of that chain lube onto the outside of the chain. So you're retaining more of the chain lube on the chain where it needs to be, and you're lubricating the parts of the chain that need to be lubricated. Now, most aerosol chain lubes take at least a couple of hours to dry. You just need to wait for the solvents to dissipate or evaporate for it to reach its proper consistency. 
So, before it dries, using that excess lube that will have deposited itself on your cardboard, gently wipe off any excess, but at the same time, deposit the chain lube onto the parts of the chain that may not have been reached while you were spraying. In particular, the inside side plates. It's a bit of a balance here, wiping off excess, but leaving enough on the chain to do the job and to protect it from corrosion. When you've done that, leave it to dry for at least a couple of hours before riding. I always like to do this and leave it overnight if I can. That way you end up with a lot less fling. And when you've done this, it's time for a general clean up of the areas of the bike that have old chain lube fling on them. You can either use Silkaline Pro Prep or if you have some of that pre-paint wipe by Upol that I use, again I'll leave links for both of those products, you can use that to clean off excess chain lube that's accumulated on various parts of the bike, like your rear swing arm, your rear wheel rim and the accessible areas around the front sprocket. And that's it really, you're good to go. As I've said, I usually re-lube about every 400 miles and I clean and re-lube after every three re-lubes, so about every 1200 miles. Chain adjustment obviously is going to be dependent on when it needs adjusting. Once again, thank you so much for watching this video, I hope it's been helpful to you. I certainly found making it a bit of an education, I still can't work out how that axle setup works. If you've enjoyed this video, please leave a like, and if you're not a subscriber, please consider subscribing to this channel. I really would appreciate that. I am, of course, going to be back on Friday, so until then, please ride safely, and I'll see you soon.